Welcome back to Breakfast Central. Now, young people have an important role in molding Nigeria's democratic processes and, and future. Uh, and of course, as the country's young population grows exponentially, it's critical to acknowledge their relative uh, power and potential as agents of positive and negative change. Nigeria, like the world's other most populous countries, has one of the youngest populations with almost 60% of its people under the age of 35. This demogra demographic uh, shift provides a once-in-a-lifetime chance for young Nigerians to actively shape the destiny of their neighborhoods and thus the country as a whole. Nonetheless, despite their numerical strength, young people in Nigeria confront numer numerous artificial barriers to political involvement. Many people are disengaged from politics because they lack trust in politicians and the government, and they have limited access to information and feel excluded from decision-making processes. Many young people are economically disenfranchised, either by individuals who do not wish to relinquish public office or by policies that are no longer in sync with contemporary economic forces. What does the future hold for the youths of Nigeria in the coming years? Our guest this morning is someone who's not new to speaking up for the young people when it matters. Today we're going to be talking about young people, their role in Nigeria's democracy and in general the state of the nation. Our guest is musician and human rights advocate. Please welcome Sheon Kuti. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Hello guys. Thanks for having me on your show. Good to have you. I mean, there's so much to talk about. I'm sure we'll get into the state of the nation, but let's start with the conversation involving young people. There are a number of young people who are currently in the system, and you've been speaking about a number of the ills in society, in politics, and in governance. So where would you say we are, you know, in terms of having more young people, you know, being involved in the democratic pro process? How far have we come, and how far do we need to go? Well, you know, in general, you know, um, there has been this, Use discussion, you know, and I've always said to people like, you know, youth is is the demographic, it's not an ideology, and everybody will pass through it and then come off it at some point, right? What is necessary is that young people are given the tools that they need by their experienced elders. Every society is a dance between the young and the old, the old providing the experience, the young providing the energy. And it is that uh, dance that I feel, you know, is not really well coordinated here. Because we have elders that are too, the word I like to use is cowardly, to engage the youths and mold them in the way that their energy can be best used to service their nation. You know, understanding that as African people, not just in Nigeria, and I don't want people to think this is a Nigerian people because we like to blame ourselves a lot here. You know, it's an African thing all over the world that African people exist. You know, um, uh, the youth have been given this, how would I put it, responsibility. Oh, you're not doing enough for this society. But, you know, what can the youth really, really do on their own? You know, I've never seen a nation built by young people. You know, there has to be some kind of guidance there. You have to provide, you know, the, the, the tools, the education. You know, and in the mindset of African people, we do believe that our mindset, our skills, our talent is to make money. And is it the fault of young people? No, it's how we are educated, that our talent is just to get rich, to make money. Nobody is teaching us that our talents are first and foremost for the development of our nation, for the development of our people. See, that is the shift that young people need, you know, in their own psyche, in their own consciousness. And they need elders that we're able to create uh, the space where that kind of mindset can flourish. Okay, for a young person that really engages himself in nation building jobs, you know, the nation building industries, uh, engineering, accounting, uh, um, med medicine, uh, medicine and health, you know, uh, law, these are nation building industries. But because Nigeria is so focused on the service industry, you find lawyers. I tell my friend that in my father's time, my father used to sing government magic, they turn electric to Kandu. <laughs> I said in our time, the government magic is that they're turning lawyers into event planners, <laughs> you know, they are turning doctors into bakers and tailors. Instead of sewing hats together, they are sewing cap and sewing shoe, you know. So we have young engineers, Nigeria is turning out thousands of engineers every year. But yeah. 
But, but don't you think that that is, you know, mostly because, you know, these people have found themselves in the situation where they need to figure out ways, you know, to survive? Yes. It's not, you know, an intentional, you know, move it's intentional. from... It, it's it, intentional. So what I'm saying is, it's not an intentional move from medicine to, you know, carpentry or to event planning. That's what I'm saying. It's intentional in the, uh, in, in the sense that it is manufactured by the masters of our society. Those that channel, you know, because we have to understand that every society is run by those that actually have the money and that's how they push society. Where they put their money is how society is rolling. Everybody knows, I mean, what's the uh, budget of weddings? They did a survey one time, it was like five billion a week in Lagos, people spend on weddings. Then, I'm sure it's double now. You know, five billion a week, I mean, wedding dresses, shoes. Yeah. So, but, how much are we spending on, let's say, space exploration, space research that would give a talented rocket engineer something to do? That would, I used to, just imagine if you are a talented historian, you went to school, you studied history, you are so good at it, your mind is, and you come out of a Nigerian university as a talented historian in a country where we lack truly our, our own story, you know? Where is the funding for such people to do research, you know? Well, well, uh, it's, so I also want to, you know, talk about because, you know, I, I might also argue that it is um, also, you know, failure of, of the direction that Nigeria has been in the last long while. That's why, of course, you would never find anyone trying to be a historian, you know, because, I mean, there's, there's no... There are people in our no. university studying history. Yeah, absolutely. But they are coming out and they just become thugs and or they start writing autobiographies for I, rich people. I, I also <laughs> want to ask about, you know, young people... Uh, today that have also been poisoned by the things that have made it difficult to fight for a better Nigeria. Um, there's people that, you know, have conversations in their 20s these days, and, you know, you hear the level of tribalism, you know, and the things that have distracted, you know, us for so long that it makes you, you know, just accept that, you know, we, we, the country would almost never be fought for. You know, no, no, this is also manufactured. You know, we have to understand, as I said, people are very... The wealth of people in this country makes them extremely powerful. And the rich can truly manifest their own reality. In this new central, I'm sure there are Yoruba people here. Yes. There are Igbo people here. There are Hausa people here working. And new central is thriving. Okay, let's say your company is not a big company. It's not, it's not national. It doesn't have a national spread. Okay, let's look at banks that have national spread. And, multinational companies that operate here on a national level with branches in every city, every state. They have all Nigerians working for them. But if the owner of that company was in the company every day, saying, Igbo people in this company are trying to destroy this company. You know what people in this company are trying to destroy this company. Was, the company will not make a profit. But that's not how they run GT Bank or Zenith Bank or any of these multinationals too that operate here from Shell to Chevron, all these big companies all over the place. That's what they do in their, in their companies. The owners make sure that there's camaraderie, work together. They, 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 they. So if Nigerians can pull profits for these companies and tribalism doesn't play a role, you know, how come we can't make our country work because of tribalism? It is because those that own our country, because we're still under ownership, decide that tribalism should be a factor in our country. It was a very strong factor in the last elections. It, it seemed that tri tribalism took front row, center stage in the last in election. In every election, and this is not the worst one. I, 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 don't, I, I don't know, maybe uh, I beg to differ. Go back to 1960 <laughs> and uh, 1966 election and find out about Operation Wet here. Okay. Even among the Yorubas, what we did to ourselves internally. Talk more of uh, tribalism in our politics. We fought a civil war for, true. for heaven's sake. Very you know? true, very true. So this is, we have so, since we've not fought one so now. So how, how do we then move past this? I mean, we're saying, and, and I can quite agree with you that it is, it is a weapon that has been manufactured by people who might want to use it for their own, who not might want to use it for their own personal, uh, personal motives. How can we then move past it to the point where if we're running for office, we're also putting a person because we think this person is good, this person is fit, not because this person is from my side of the divide. And then the argument about zoning, would it then uh, hold water? Zoning is something that's agreed among our elites. It's not as if we did referendum as the people of Nigeria and agreed that there must be zoning. Zoning is how our elites have agreed to share power among themselves. It's a class decision, it's not a national decision. 
zoning holds no water if Nigerians are truly engaged and involved in the development of their own country. You know, um, in the last uh, uh, election, young people, you know, you have to understand that there's a lot of poverty in the land. You know, with poverty comes this, how do I put it, uh, insecurity, you know, impatience. You know, uh, so many things can happen to you at once when you are poor that you live a life of trepidation, almost. You know, the slightest sickness changes your existence completely if you're a poor person. Like malaria, ah, I just go buy medicine. I mean, if you're poor, it's not the same. You know, and for this reason, we have to understand that a lot of people can be easily manipulated due to their own lack of information as well. You know, so these factors play in a lot into the psyche of young people. And as I said, we are left on our own. We are truly left on our own. That's why I always implore Nigerian um, professionals, you know. We are the ones that the ancestors have given some certain comforts within this oppressive system. And it is a real shame that we rather align with the elites than align with the people as professionals of Nigeria. You know, be it in the media, you know, we must understand our responsibility you know, that we've been given a huge task as the professionals of this country, you know, because our people are left on their own. We are the ones that have to build that bridge to them to open their eyes to the world because they don't know. They are not educated enough. They are not, they understand what they're going through, but they just don't know it. You know, we are the ones that can show it to them, right. you know. I, 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 um, we might just come back to the youth conversation eventually, but uh, we have a few minutes before we go on a break. Um, I want you to speak on, you know, our current reality. Um, in, in the local terms, you know, as they say, as, do you, would you say Nigerians have enter, entered one chance again? Um, <laughs> with regards to the current government, um, and you can see their response to almost everything that has happened in the last you know, few weeks in Nigeria, including the kidnapping, you know, in, in the FCT. Again, we imply that we came down from the bus and they entered another one. It's the same bus. You know, <clears throat> one of the secrets of this world is democracy. It's a secret. It has, it's so open and it's so inclusive that it's a huge, it's such a huge secret. That's why they have to hide it in such a plain sight because the humanity we've not really discovered democracy. We had it before. Some African societies were truly democratic. Switzerland is close, but humanity is pulled away from it, even though the world, the, the world is used a lot. Because what we call democracy today, it, all over the world, is basically the rich people in, a, in every country dividing themselves into two groups and continually ruling the rest of the country over and over again, you know, for whatever reason that they say that they are different. You know, yeah. but I always tell friends of mine that no matter what is happening in this country, it's political space. Those politicians are shareholders in companies and they sit on boards of companies together. And this is where decisions of countries are made, not only in Nigeria. You know, it's in the boards of these corporations in America, in the UK, in Canada. This is where the decisions that run nations are made because that's what unites the elites, right. the okay. boards. I'd like to talk more about where Nigeria currently is and what the projections for the future are after this break. Welcome back to Breakfast Central. We're still looking at Nigeria's democracy, the involvement and the role of young people, where we are now and where we ought to be. We're joined by Sheon Kuti, who's been here with us. Thank you once again for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right, before we went on the break, we were talking about this current administration and you know, a number of the things you said are that the future of Nigeria is in the hands of Nigerian professionals. Yeah. When you say that, what do you mean? And how can... You know, do these professionals reshape where we are? Because you've also said that it's not like we've entered one chance, it's a continuation. Uh, you say, from the last the, administration. You say have, we, have we entered one chance again? I'm like, ah, it sounds like we have come down before, <laughs> uh, entering another bus. It's the same bus. <laughs> we didn't come down. <laughs> or rather, they've not thrown us out yet, emotion. Oh my God. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I, I believe that the Nigerian professional doesn't yet understand his power, you know, or her power. You know, um, he, we are used against our own people. 
Because all these politicians we talk about, they don't come down from their gilded towers to come and perpetuate any nonsense. They need the bankers to launder the money. You know, they need the media to tell their lies. They need the doctors. You know, they need the pro pro uh, professors and lecturers and teachers to take bribe from students. And so when we succumb to these things, and the truth is this, it's not as if you can't live a comfortable, like in my own field as well. Yes, because of the kind of music I make, okay, maybe I don't have access to certain things and certain contracts don't come my way where I feel, oh, this is perfect for me, I should have been in there. Yeah, but I still have a very good life. And I think it's the same for everybody. Not playing the game doesn't necessarily mean you're just going to be poor. You have a good life, but maybe some of your colleagues will just be doing better than you. So we need professionals that are willing to sacrifice that. that okay, fine, don't worry. But well, in this side that we control, in this office or in this company or in this uh, civil uh, service job, in this place that we mount, this place will be straight, you know, regardless of the personal price we have to pay. Because we as Africans forget that we are children of sacrifice. We as professional Africans, especially, that whatever we achieve today, as black people in this world, whatever, because you know, you're these rappers, I'm a self-made man. For black people, that's, there's no black man that can be self-made. It's impossible because everything you are doing, somebody died for you to do it. We are not like the Asians or the Indians or anybody in this capitalist system. We are the only ones that had to fight for every single advantage, not only say advantage, not even an advantage, right and privilege that was handed to everybody with ease. Is it to go to school? Somebody died. Is it to vote? Somebody died. To be a lawyer? Somebody died. To enter the bus? Somebody died. To walk on the road, on the pavement? Somebody. Every step of the way, you are a child of sacrifice. Somebody has seen you before you were even born and believed that you are worthy of the, sacrifice, of the blood sacrifice that you need to access this system and pull your people up. You know, so many of us climb this ladder that our ancestors have built with their blood and their bones. We get to the top and we just kick the ladder over. <laughs> you know, and then we prefer to stay on top and start talking to our people down. You know, not understanding that we are supposed to use now resources. Instead of, we don't need to use blood, blood, blood and bone anymore. The resources we find at the top of the ladder, build more ladders, bring our people up. Yeah. You know, that's the game. Because when people say, uh, oh, Nigeria, uh, we are helping people to, uh, escape, that's helping people. Yeah. Give, give them visa, you're helping them. I said, why not turn the country to where people don't have to escape from? Why not do that work? Why do we think that, you know, helping people, you know, why does the prison ex exist in the first place? Yeah. Why do we have to scale the fence when we can break down the walls? That's the point. I mean, it, takes, it will take a, a lot of, you know, chain mindset to break down those walls, you know, but, you know, it, it, the reason I asked the question before was, um, so, so from your analogy, we didn't come down from the boss, you know, we've been in the same boss and, you know, and that same boss, you know, will continue to take us, you know, further and further and further. Um, <laughs> you know, so are you then saying, you know, to Nigerians that they shouldn't expect anything different this time from the Nigerian government? Um, whatever promises that they maybe were leaning towards uh, with the hopes that the Tunuba administration will be able to bring forth, you know? Yeah, I don't have any hope in the ruling class of this country. I've not, they've not really shown me any example or anything really that proves to me that they are on the side of their own people, you know. Uh, I'm somebody that deals a lot with vibe, spirit, but most especially, I believe in evidence, yeah. you know. Our budget of this year is no different in priorities to the budget of last year or the budget of the year before. And that's how you know really what you're elites are thinking, what is important to them, you know. The president made some few personal cuts in his own traveling allowance here and there. But when you look at the budget itself, you know, that's how you know that there's no real difference, you know. So, yeah. What hope would you say you have in Nigeria's law enforcement agencies in ensuring that they bring <laughs> some form of sanity into the country as is and ensure that they help protect and uh, protect the rights of Nigerian citizens? I think the Nigerian security agencies, you know, like Nigerian people too, suffer from the 
manipulations of, the, of our elites. Uh, they are just not equipped to deal with. We have over 200 million Nigerians. They say, how many people are in the police? It's not up to 2 million. How many people are in, you know, we don't have up to 2 million police officers in this country. You know, uh, and it's supposed to be 1 to 10 policing. You know, real policing, you know, so. And the violence that exists in this country continues to rise exponentially. In my neighborhood, I've lived in the same neighborhood for 40 years, all my life. I could go out and play and do everything, but now I can't let my daughter go out on her own. What? In fact, now I realize what my mother was beating me up for when I would run away from the house and go and play and come back in the evening. Ibo lolo, ofe pa mini. But, you know, so the, the Nigeria of today and uh, the security, they, just, they are not equipped. They're just not equipped. So do you think that hiring more police officers would be, I mean, they, they recently... I don't think hiring police officers is even the thing first. Okay. You know, our, the ones we have now have to be retrained to understand that they're no longer an occupying force. This is no longer the colonial Nigeria. The Nigerian police and army are still in the colonial mindset. Checkpoints, roadblocks, profiling every African, where are you going, where are you coming from. We have to understand that it's only black people that are still police like this all over the world. And for us to police ourselves like that, it means we're not really about our own security. We're just about the security of the few. And when you look at how the security apparatus is set up in this country, you will know the people that the government wants protected. I mean, in your own house, you don't have number to even call police. But in front of their house, there's police van with police officers. They don't even have to make phone calls. Just, hey, police don't. But at the same time, like Bolaige, those police can still all live at the same time when you need them the most. <laughs> so that's the conundrum of relying on the security apparatus, you know. So we must retrain our soldiers, retrain our police officers to understand that they are there to uh, protect the dignity of African people. Were well, these also some of the things that you you noticed or you also experienced uh, personally? Um, you had an incident with the police uh, a couple of months ago, I believe. No, almost a year ago. About okay, about a year ago. So, so, so were these also some of the things that you also got to, you know, get a first-hand experience in? Well, my own. I don't want to use my own case as an example because I'm in court. You know, so. Uh, they don't let me go easily for anything in this country. I have to go and face my, my day. <laughs> so let me, let, me not, <laughs> let me not talk too much about my own situation, you know, specifically. But you, know, you should know, like, me, growing up, I've always been in constant contact with the Nigerian security forces. From when I was a child, I mean, I was nine years old when I first saw the police shoot one of my father's uh, boys right in front of our house you know, and killed him, you know, because they were coming to Red Kalakuta, you know. Growing up, that was a natural occurrence. Every day, or at least once or twice a week, police gunshot and raiding our house, you know. So, and my father was not a criminal. He'd never stolen anything before. You know, the man, he didn't even lie, you know. At least to me. I don't know, my mother says he lied a lot. <laughs> but you know how we men are. <laughs> you know, so the security, you know, I mean, they just need, we need that one is a different case entirely. You know, origins of our army, you know, from Queen's Guard, West African Frontier Boys, Air Force, the Hausa Boys, the mindset of that, that Oyibo trained them in a way that they were protecting, to protect Oyibo's interests, they were willing to kill their own people. That's something we must always remember as the origins of our army. That these were the people willing to kill us to protect European interests. Mm -hmm. You know, has that mindset been changed? Have we done any work? Or we are still sending them to Sandhurst, sending them to a war college in America to continue this indoctrination, you know? And we are surprised, you know, when they come back to our countries and do coup. My father said something very important in Teacher Don't Teach Me Nonsense. He said, Why Oyibo did not tell Ami Self that for England, Ami not fit take over? You know, and that's fact. England has had five prime ministers in the last two years. That means there's a constitutional crisis. The country is not politically moving. You can't hear any army general or constable thinking inside that they want to do coup. But just come to just one constitutional decision like this. He blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting that a number of the songs that your father sang about 
till today, they're very relevant. We see them being reflected. There's no way that we can wrap up this conversation without me asking. Let me just touch very lightly on State of the Nation as we wrap up. Okay. Um, the drama concern involving Beta Edu, Olubu Mitun Jiojo, and uh, potentially now there have been allegations of uh, Bajabi Amila also being involved. So, that as letter, quickly as he, possible. He let this, uh, he's, uh, as quickly as possible, let's hear your thoughts on... You no, know, no, no, no. I mean, I, I don't want Nigeria... See, Nigerians, I don't want us to, this is how they get us. You know, yeah, we can, all the fun and games. Me, God, I like, the, I like, I talked about it because the woman's name was just a nice, we were just set up for a pawn, you know, so I was like, ah, Nigerian politicians, they do better. You know, it was just like, it was just there. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was there. But these things don't faze me. It don't faze me because you hear about this one, but trust me, this is a drop, drop in the bucket. You know, the, the fact that in this country, my own belief, in this country, multinationals can come to this country. Mm? This is legal, completely legal now. Mm? That's not even a, this is not a crime. At least this one we are saying is kind of a crime. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> Politicians, a multinational corporation can come to this country. Let's say it comes with a billion. I don't want to name any company. I have an example. I don't want to name any yeah. company. Come with a billion, boom, a billion dollars, put in our economy. And with that one billion, can take fifteen billion dollars out of our economy. It's a double slap in the face. Not only that, Nigerians are buying things in Naira, so that company is not making dollar here, right. and it's still about to pull out that money. It will go to the CBN to ask for dollar. The CBN will take our oil money because CBN doesn't print dollar. Now we're going to take our oil money and we'll give these people to take out. Whereas in America, if you go to America, the money American people give you, you can never take it out of America. Right. You can only take your initial investment. So. There's so much that you know, needs to be undone when it comes to Nigeria and uh, ensuring that we do what's best for Nigerian citizens. But thank you so much for it's joining us and for always speaking up. <laughs>